Focus on your breath. That's all I have to do tonight for this next hour. Just try to be as aware of the breath as you can, all the way in, all the way out. Notice where you feel it. And keep watch over your mind to make sure it stays with the breath. If you simply try to force it, it's not going to want to stay. It'll want to wander off. So do what you can to make the breath interesting. Try to notice when you breathe in in different ways, what effect does it have on the body? What effect does it have on the mind? What kind of breathing is most comfortable? What way of conceiving the breath is most comfortable? You can think of it as the air coming in and out through the nose, or you can think about the flow of energy in the body that allows the air to come in and out. If it weren't that flow of energy, nothing would come in or out at all. So where do you feel that flow of energy? For most people it's in the chest, but it can also be in the shoulders, in different parts of the head. And in fact, as you get more sensitive to what's going on in the body, you begin to realize that the whole body is connected to the breathing. Every nerve out to every pore of the skin is involved in the breathing process in one way or another. So if you can think of the breath suffusing throughout the body, what effect does it have on the way you breathe? What effect does it have on the way you feel here in the present moment? Because how you're going to get through the hour here it depends on what you're doing right now. Years back there was a woman who brought a friend to what we call our outdoor classroom. It's out under the trees. for an hour of meditation, and the friend wasn't really prepared. But it was a lovely day. The sun wasn't too hot. There was a nice gentle breeze. And at the end of the session, the friend said she never suffered so much in her life. Because she didn't know what to do with the breath, just sitting there with nothing to do. You give yourself something to do with the breath. Notice how you talk to yourself about the breath. We often think of meditation as involving not thinking at all. But in the beginning especially, there's going to be some conversation inside about what to do, what not to do. So as long as there's going to be some conversation, focus it on the breath. Focus it on the mind, keeping the mind with the breath. And if you do this with some skill, you find that it creates a sense of well-being. If you do it without any skill, it can be pretty miserable. So try to be observant, because that's what skill is all about. And remind yourself, the whole purpose of this is to find happiness, a true happiness, a happiness that goes deeper than the ordinary happiness. And think about the qualities that lead to happiness. One of the qualities the Buddha said is respect. After his awakening, he reflected. Now that he was awakened and there was no one else in the world who was awakened, there was no one he could pay respect to. And as he said, people who live without something to respect live in misery. Think about that. If you live in a world where you don't respect anybody or there's not, no principle that you respect, life gets pretty, pretty mean. gets reduced to just bare grubbing for our life, li livelihood and fighting other people off and then dying at the end. You can't respect yourself. You can't respect others. It's a miserable place to be. But if there's something you respect, something that you feel is higher than you are, something that gives you a sense of direction, that you respect, then even though, though you haven't gotten there yet, the fact that you have that object of respect is something that gives a sense of well-being. So ask yourself, who do you respect? What do you respect? Is this really worthy of respect? In the Buddhist case, he, after realizing that there was no other person he could respect, he had to respect the Dharma that he'd awakened to. He would bow down to that, he said. And everything he did was going to be in line with that.
That's the first thing to think about. And you ask yourself, well, why do we respect the Dharma? Well, the Dharma respects your desire for true happiness. It wants you to respect that desire for true happiness, too. That's what is discovered in his awakening. True happiness is possible, something that is not subject to any condition. So it's not going to be affected, it's not going to be taken away by any condition. That does exist, and it can be found through human effort. So wherever in the mind is that desire for true happiness, the Buddha is basically saying, respect that. And not only respect it, here's how you work on it, here's how you develop it. That kind of teaching, that kind of teacher, is someone really worthy of respect. After all, the Buddha didn't charge for his teachings. He freely taught. And went all over India to find the people who were ready to teach. And he worked at setting out the, the teachings together with the Sangha so that the teachings would survive, even after he was gone. And here we are, almost 2,600 years later, and the teachings are still here, still worth of respect. So if as you're practicing you have any doubts about the practice or doubts about yourself, ask yourself why. What do you respect instead? And is it really worth their respect? And then give the Buddhist teachings a try. That relates to another set of qualities that the Buddha says lead to happiness. As you say, these are the qualities that make you into a deva. A deva is a being in a realm of real, real bliss. Not the ultimate, but much higher than the human level. But the qualities of deva are qualities that we can develop too, which means that they can give us happiness. And the first is conviction. And here conviction doesn't mean that you believe blindly whatever the Buddha said, but you do believe in the fact that he was awakened and that his teachings are worth giving a try, a serious try. And what do they teach you? They teach you the power of your actions. This is another reason why they're worthy of respect. Anyone who teaches you that your reactions don't matter, you have to wonder, what do they want out of you? If someone teaches you that your actions do matter, they're throwing the responsibility on you. They don't want to get anything out of you, but they do want you to be responsible and to remind you that you have to be responsible for yourself. We were talking this afternoon about the committee of the mind, the different voices that come up in the mind. And one you have to watch out for is one that says, it doesn't matter what you do. Go ahead and act on your impulse. Well, conviction is there to remind you, well, not all impulses are good and they do matter. Which ones you choose to follow, which ones you don't choose to follow, they do matter. So in this way, conviction is like a stick, but it's also like a carrot. It reminds you, you do have it within your power to change the way you act. No matter how unskillfully you may have been acting in the past, you can change. And true happiness is within the range of your power. Do you want to let that possibility go? Or do you want to act on it? This is where another one of the qualities that lead to happiness comes in. That's learning. You learn the steps that the Buddha taught. When he talks about virtue, what does he mean? When he talks about generosity, when he talks about meditation, learn about these things. Our educational system nowadays teaches you how to be a good member of the society, produ productive and all that, but it doesn't teach you how to find happiness. For that, you have to start learning on your own. And this is a good place to start, because this is what these teachings are all about. As the Buddha said, the teachings all have one taste, which is the taste of release. And here is release is the ultimate bliss. So it's good to read up on these things. Following that, there's generosity, being willing to give. 
give of material things, give of your time, give of your energy, give of your knowledge. The Buddha would often teach generosity in conjunction with gratitude. And those we're here to give, not to get, because we've already received so much. It's the opposite of a sense of entitlement. People who are entitled are never happy because they feel that they're not getting what they deserve, not getting enough. If you realize so, that you've already been on the receiving end of a lot of goodness, the fact that you know a language depends on, other pe depends on the fact that other people taught it to you. That you know how to deal in the world depends on other people have taught you. So have some gratitude for them and then be generous to the world in response. Because if you're looking for opportunities to be generous, they're there. And it gives you a sense of inner wealth instead of wanting to get, 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 receive, 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 where well, there's never any enough. You realize if you have something to share, okay, there's already more than enough. That sense of having more than enough, that's a real happiness, regardless of what the actual material circumstances around you are. The frame of mind, the state of mind that wants to be generous, that wants to give, that's a happy state of mind. Another quality is virtue, abstaining from things you know are harmful. And the pleasure that comes from this is being able to look back at your actions and realize there's nothing with which you can blame yourself, nothing you have to be ashamed about, nothing you have to hide from yourself. You're not a weight on the world. You don't harm yourself, you don't harm others, and you don't get them to act harmfully either. So when you sit down to meditate, you can sit down with a clear conscience. Then there's discernment, your ability to see exactly what you're doing while you're doing it, and to see what the results are, both the immediate results and the long-term ones, and to gain a sense of what kind of actions, what kind of motivations for actions are skillful. And which ones are unskillful? The Buddha said his pursuit of the path started with the realization that he had to divide his thoughts into two types, those that were skillful, those that were not. The unskillful ones were the ones that were imbued with sensuality, in other words, this fascination with thinking about sensual pleasures, wanting to get this pleasure, wanting to get that pleasure, weighs the mind down. Thoughts imbued with ill will, thoughts imbued with harmfulness. And the discernment lay not only realizing that these were unskillful, but also learning how to keep them in check so they didn't take over. As for thoughts in the word that were skillful, in view of renunciation, in other words, looking for a pleasure elsewhere than in sensuality. Thoughts of goodwill, thoughts of harmlessness. Those he said you could think all day and they wouldn't be harmful. But you still wanted to be mindful of where they were going to make sure they didn't start wandering off track. He gave a comparison with a cowherd. During the rainy season when the rice is growing, the cowherd has to keep check on the cows to make sure they don't go wandering and eating the rice, eating the rice plants. In the same way, you have to keep check on your unskillful thoughts. But then after the rice has been harvested and there's no danger, you can just let the cows wander as they like, but just remember they're there. So the time comes in the end of the day when you have to get them, get them home. But as the Buddha realized, even though it's possible to think these thoughts without harm, they still tire the mind. And this combination of virtue and discernment, this lies at the basis of what's needed to get the mind into good concentration. We talk about gaining discernment from concentration, but you need to have some discernment to get the mind into concentration to begin with. Because you know what to do, where to look, where the real problems are. This is the ultimate source of happiness, is realizing the problems are not outside, the problems are inside. And if you can clear up the problems inside, that's the end of the problem. So you've got to train the mind. And because you've been building this on virtue, there are no 
walls in the mind that bar things off. In other words, there's not a lot of denial about what's going on, because mindfulness is the basis of concentration, and that requires your ability to remember things for a long time, so you can learn lessons from the past about what's worked and what hasn't worked in the mind. So you can keep applying those lessons in the present moment. So as your mindfulness gets established, it turns into concentration. And there's a bliss that comes with the mind's ability just to settle down and be with one object. At first you have to make adjustments so the mind fits the object and the object fits the mind. In other words, what kind of breathing would feel good now? What way of conceiving the breath would be good both for the mind and the breath right now? What do you have to change in the way you're doing? And then when things begin to feel good, then you just try to settle down. Let that sense of ease spread through the body. As for any other thoughts that may come up, you don't need to get engaged. These are some of the qualities that can make this into a happy hour. And you bring these qualities to the meditation that makes all the difference. Because one of the important principles of karma is that not so much what you did in the past that matters, but it's what you're doing right now that matters. There may be some limitations coming in from the past, but your choices about what to focus on, what to do with what you've got right here. Those make the difference between whether you're going to suffer or not suffer at any given moment. So keep careful watch over what you're doing right now, because that's the source of true happiness. If you do it with skill, and the skill is something you can learn. That's the good news of the Buddhist teachings. Your happiness doesn't have to depend on people outside or things outside. It depends on your ability to develop a skill, to take your desire for true happiness seriously. Not in a grim way, but with a lot of attention and a lot of care.